Welcome everyone to another episode of Cow and People, and today we've got role reversal. I'm Terry, so I get to sit on the fence today and uh, ask you the question. So, I mean, Terry, you've uh, started this wonderful opportunity for us all to share our thoughts. So, you tell us, how did you become a Cow and fan? Oh, mate, thanks for the introduction. The professional fence sitter. The professional fence sitter he is. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, how did it start? So, for me, I was born into a family where mum was a Carlton supporter, my grandfather was an Essendon supporter, passionate. Um, early in my life we had a bit of adversity uh, to go through, you know, single mum raising us, um, you know, got to see some pretty pretty poor things, you know, domestic violence and the like. Um, my my uh, biological father got up and left when I was really young, so, you know, dealing with that at a very young age was, was tough and I remember going to the footy for the first time as one of my early memories and uh, we're at Optus Oval. I remember we were playing, I think it was St Kilda, and I just remember the joy, the passion, I remember the excitement, and it was my first memory of, of happiness. And it was sort of at a, at a time where things were um, difficult and really challenging for a little five-year-old, four, four and a half, five-year-old to, to see. Um, and that was really, I mean, my first love. That was one of the first things I look at and I say, yeah, that was the first time I really felt you know something on the inside so i think that's that's where it really began oh definitely i do think sport has that wonderful ability to no matter what's going on in your personal life for an hour you can escape yeah. two hours you can escape what you're going yeah so i mean you, you talk about the early days like what's your big moment when you think being a count fan what was the the moment to you a player or something that sticks out in your mind that's a count and memory for you yeah i remember I remember watching the 99 grand final. Well, I remember watching the 95 grand final, I should say, on, uh, on a video. So mum had a video, we used to go to one of her friend's houses and they had the, the game on video. Obviously I was four when the game was on, so I don't remember the actual granny, but I remember watching the video and like watching it over and over and over and over again. Um, Kuda was my first hero. Uh, I think that normally happens with young, young kids when they watch sport. Uh, they sort of attract themselves to their sporting hero. So watching Kuda, um, I remember the 99 grand final, watching that as well. Um, I remember that very clearly. Uh, I just remember the start, we kicked the first goal of the game and it was a bit of excitement. Um, and then it probably didn't really kick in until we drafted Mark Murphy. Uh, he was like the young kid coming up. Uh, and then we got, you know, Gibbs and Cruiser. And at that point, that's where I really started remembering everything in detail. I think one of the better feelings I've felt, and this probably goes to show where the club's at and where we've been. Yeah. Apart from this year where I've really felt the joy and excitement on another level, uh, it was round three, 2012. Played Collingwood, smashed them by 10 goals. Murph had 35 and three, gave the Collingwood supporters the finger. It was great. And I remember it was a Friday night and I remember leaving that game saying, oh my God, we're going to win the flag. And I haven't, quite, <laughs> I haven't quite felt that since, but there was just this unbelievable air of confidence and, and happiness that the boys had really turned the corner and, you know, we're going to go places. So 2012 is a moment that really sticks out. Um, 2011, the final against the Bombers, obviously. I've got a lot of Essendon mates who, you grow up, you have the, the battles yeah. online. You, yeah. you know, Facebook came into my life when I was a teenager, so having all the online battles with Essendon supporters and Collingwood supporters and, you know, Judd's better than Dane Swan. Um, so when we did beat the Bombers, like, I, my Essendon mates, and Andrew Polifiore, if you're watching, this is for you. Like, <laughs> I'm so happy to be on this side of that, that final win. Like, can you imagine being Essendon and kicking the first three goals of the game and then just shitting the bed? Well, you know I mean, what I mean? They haven't won since Sheedy, oh, so mate. it's a long time for, for Bombers fans. Yeah, but, um, yeah, for me, Carlton's just... You know, you go through life, you grow up, you try and figure yourself out and you try and figure out what you love and, you know, I, this is one thing that's always remained constant, it's Carlton. There's an unexplainable love and passion and excitement that just goes throughout my body when I'm watching, when I'm consuming uh, and, it, you know, like you said, sport brings people together. Like, I'm, I met you through through the club, really. Uh, it's fascinating when you, you know, go around the country when you go around to other countries and you meet supporters how you connect so yeah yeah I mean definitely it's the European club isn't it Carl and so we've got that heritage so 
as a European, you're kind of forced to support them as well. Yep. I mean, you talk about the long journey you've had yourself with Carlton. Yeah. Carlton have had a really tough 10 years. So what? how do you vote the last 10 years? Like, Do you think we've done a good job of the rebuild? Do you think it's been a, a poor job? You know, Where do you sit with that? We have the common, the common saying, like, you know, we've been shit for 20 years. I don't agree with that. Um, I know that we didn't do, didn't win the flag in that period of 20, you know, 2009 to 2011, 2012. But you know, we were kick out of a prelim against the West Coast Eagles, and that was a real building moment. We went and got Chris Judd. Um, that's probably the other thing I should mention as well. Bring in Juddy, which I'll, I'll get to that. But we had that period where we were up and coming, and then obviously we went and got Mick, and, and other events happened, and injuries happened, and it sort of dwindled down. This period is really the first time that me as a, as a sports fan, and I'm at a point now where I understand the industry a little bit better than what I did five, six years ago. It's the first time we've really gone through the process of what you need to do to actually be successful for the long term. The old Carlton gets spoken about, just go and get the big fish, go pay the money. Um, the landscape's changed. And so uh, I'm so confident, because I remember 2013, when the likes of Robbo were in the team, Jared Waite, and it was kind of this feeling like, yeah, we've got Chris Judd and we've got Murph and Gibbs, but look, where are the kids? Where There's no future. Uh, whereas now it's like, it's only future. You know what I mean? There's, there's, only, there's only the future for this club. They're only up and coming. So, yeah, I'm really happy with how the rebuild's gone, but the reality is, I think, I think no matter what, I'd always find a positive. You know, it's just the nature of being a, a fan and a one-eyed fan, if you want to call it. But yeah, I'd, I'd say that's your best skill. You can find a positive. <clears throat> I, I'm quite negative at times, yeah. and I get criticised by that for the fans. You're always backed up. That you're always find that good thing. We're talking about good things. We talked about Chris Judd. He's my favourite player. He's the first player that sticks out in my mind. Yeah. Like, you tell me about what Judd brought to the club and brought to you personally. So, I was in year 12, 2008, when he crossed over. And um, uh, if you speak to anyone at high school, they'll, they'll tell you exactly who I am just by Carlton. So, I used to go to school every morning. Mum would go to work real early, so she'd drop me off. And I'd go to the library every morning. And the first thing I would do is go to get the Herald Sun. And he, oh, Chris Judd, he was always in the paper. So, I used to cut out every single Chris Judd picture in the newspaper that there ever was and I would stick it on my locker to the point where if, at the end of the year, like I'm not kidding you, there would have been at least 120 photo, like pictures of Judd inside my locker. Um, he brought he, he brought something else. Like he, he was, uh, you know, the dark times and he was the, the guy that brought the hope um, and you know, I remember when he first came, and you know, I'm sure the audience remembers when, when he used to get the ball, when he used to touch the ball. There was like this sigh of like just this this, this excited sigh, and it was fascinating. Um, and it really all culminated in 2013 when he kicked that goal. But he had many performances, you know, before that. I remember his breakout game for the club because he was coming off the osteitis pubis from West Coast. I remember he played really well against the doggies. It was something like round 17. It was the first time he really had one of those games where we were like, oh, okay. Um, and then he just brought joy. Like that left-footed goal against Geelong, uh, thanks to Robbie Warnock for hitting the post that game, you big giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he just had moments where he brought something else. And he's an interesting one because he obviously openly talks about not wanting to be a hero because he's an athlete. People don't know the real him, and I get that. but. Those sporting moments when you support your team and a champion comes along and does these incredible things, that they, I have goosebumps, like they give you something else, you know, they give you something else. So he, he meant, he gave the club hope again and put us on the map. And, you know, in, in a sense, he's still at the club, he's still doing great things. And I always cherish those seven and a half or eight years that he was at the club. Um, but yeah, he was a very special part of, of my, my Carlton experience. Oh, 100%. I mean, I remember seeing Judd, like we had my story last week, first time, and it was always, I, I hear what you're saying, the crowd erupted oh. when he got the ball. It was, you kind of as a fan had a feeling something was going to happen. Yeah. And I haven't felt that, and I don't know if you agree, since Sam Walsh signed for the club, 
Sam Walsh now seems to have the gravity. Some, yeah, seems to the JLT. I've heard the fans when he touches the ball. Yeah, something happens in the yeah, ground. Yeah, yeah. It's an expectation. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, Favol is another one who used to do it. There was just this this reassuredness when he was lining up. You just were confident. Fair kicks this. You know, so those games against the Bombers where we were down 48, you know, those comebacks. He used to always play well against Collingwood. They were very great times. Sam Walsh definitely has it. I think um, I think Charlie Kerno has that thing. Now he's got to play consistently and he's got to stay healthy. Um, but that Doggies game in 2019, this year, was the first time probably since Feb that I got that, oh, that rush you know, um, that rush of, oh my God, what's going on? This is this is like an out-of-body experience. And, he, you know, ever since Fev, no one's really been able to really encapsulate the fans. And I think Charlie Kerner is probably another one that has has that ability. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so where do you see Carlton going? Like, for you as a fan, where do you see us in five years? If I snap forward five years, what would you say would be a oh, success? They're ha- they're, in five years from today, there, there's got to be a flag. Uh, with this group uh, or I mean we've, we've got to be relevant we've got to be in that top six top four bracket we've got to be making prelims okay maybe a flag is a big call but really in five years from now you know you're talking about uh, Patrick Cripps being you know 29 you're talking about Sam Walsh being 25 you, you know if everything looks like it seems right now you would think that these guys are going to be at the peak of their powers they're going to have built the the scars, because you need the scars to win a flag. You know, I mean, I think that's the, the one thing I've, I've learnt. You need the scars to really allow it. Failure is part of success in life as well. So I would imagine us and I would hope that we're playing consistent finals football. I would imagine that we're playing in prelims, grannies, and, you know, hopefully, you know, making a grant. I just, it hurts. Like, I want it so badly. And it's interesting because I, I love the climb in probably any, anything that I do. I really enjoy the climb. I wonder. I always wonder what's the passion for the club going to be like once we win the flag? Because we're we're just at the very bottom and we're climbing, 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 getting there. And I'm sort of I'm excited for the grand final and the the grand final win, but I'm also a little bit nervous or mindful. Like, what's it going to do for me? Because once we win, it's going to be like, okay, well, what are we next? Well, now what? You know. Um, but yeah, that 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 journey. Yeah, it just resonates with me so much. I mean, history does say that Carlton go 20 plus years without a flag after the war they did, and mm-hmm. then won the next six yep. out of 12. So we know that usually Carlton's dry periods are synonymous with dominance after. Yep. So we did talk and talk about Judd being the beacon of hope. Yeah. Would you say Chris and um, Patrick Cripps now is the beacon of hope? Yeah. <laughs> like, he's something else, isn't he? So I have a, I have a, a saying called the Great White Hope. And uh, I say to my girlfriend all the time, I talk about Carlton, obviously, with every spare breath that I have. And I always say, babe, Patrick Cripps, Great White Hope. Who's this Jacob Weeder? Oh, babe, he's the Great White Hope. You know, um, yeah, I, I think he does uh, resemble like the Great White Hope. But I also think that it's probably something I've learned in, the, in recent times is we, as much as we want to, you know, uh, idolise and heroise a particular player, we have a good spread of, you know, really quality players. Like a good, there's about five or six of them on the list right now that could eventually really become like top ten players in the league. There's a real potential there for it. Um, and so Patrick Cripps probably symbolises the beginning of the new era. Um, you know, I, I get shivers thinking about him winning a flag, like enduring and staying with the club and not leaving and getting the reward and um, it's exciting times I mean I'm looking here or at Norton's and I'm looking at the the premiership back pages of the Herald Sun like we're gonna have 2021 or 2022 or both or whatever it is so it's gonna be exciting to really track the journey and, and be there from the beginning of it you know Oh, 100%. I mean, for me, like, we talk about iconic images as well. Like, for me, an iconic image that sticks in my mind was Cripps last year against Fremantle when he took his shirt off. Yeah. And you saw the bruises from all the suction candle treatment he had. Yeah. And he was a battered and bruised man. And I think, for me, it's an iconic image when we win a flag. Yeah. Because he symbolised the rough period that he stood up. Yeah. So, like, for you, what sticks out as a 
a, a kind of a poignant moment in this change around for Carlton Football Club? The moment that sticks out for me, um, it's the Fremantle win. And the reason why I say that is because it was the, the no Crips. I know that we, we love Crips and we know that he's going to be a Carlton legend and, you know, he'll probably have a statue or, you know, you know he'll, he'll go down in so long as he stays healthy. Um, but it's really that Fremantle win where I thought to myself, fuck, it's turning around like we did it without Crips. And if you really think about how the season played out, a lot of key players were injured. Like, mate, we beat St Kilda with no Liam Jones and no Jacob Wiedering. Like, that doesn't happen in the past, in the past three, four, five years when we lose those key cogs. Yeah. Charlie's been out for however long. And, like, we found a way to win. So the Fremantle game sort of said to me, like, it was a little bit of a growing up moment. Uh, and we're going to have more of them. We're going to have a we're going to have a lot more disappointment coming our way. It's just the nature of the beast. But that for me was the real turning point. It was a grit and grind win. It was the Sunday night, the graveyard shift away to Frio in the rain. Every reason to just put the cork in and have an honourable loss. Um, but something happened that day for me where I thought, all right, we turned it around, and there's 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 something else here. I, I think there was for me two things stand out from that win. Was one that. Uh, it's the biggest turnaround I've had in sport. I remember Kerno going down and going off in the first quarter. Yeah. And literally, mentally, I wrote the game off. Yeah. When that happened, I was like, well, we're going to lose by 7 8. Yeah. And also, I think it was a turning point for Mark Murphy, and I know he's your boy. Yeah. And anyone who follows this channel knows that you are the biggest Mark yeah, Murphy fan. Like, you probably support Mark more than his parents do. Yeah, probably. And. I think when he kicked that goal, I have never seen one negative about Matt Murphy it's since good. that point. It's warranted. I mean, there was a lot of, I say it a lot, like a lot of talk about how he's soft and is this and that. And for me, that hurts because he was like, again, me growing up, he was the first memory of the new generation where I remember them from the beginning. And man, all the all the contacts he had, like he had the big collision with, with Dangerfield that set it off. And then he had the broken cheekbone with Hodge, broken scapula against Melbourne when he reached out for a tackle another collision with Dangerfield where he had the syndesmosis injury, like all these collision injuries. And it was kind of like, have you all forgotten about when he did put his body on the line? You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, I understand the caper, you know, we're passionate fans. I understand we're starved of success and we demand excellence. And I, I get it and I love it. I just think we sometimes cross the line a little bit when it comes to some of our, our champions. And, you know, Murph was down on his form in a couple last previous years. He was also injured, you know, and that hurts. And a guy like him, he's not, he's, you know, you've got to be a little self-aware here. He's just not a Crips figure where it's like, come with me and I'm going to use my brute strength to get a lift out of us. He's always going to be a guy that uses his talent and his skill. And he, he needs a guy like Crips to feed him the ball and put him in the right positions. I played basketball growing up and I wasn't a point guard. I was, you know, a small forward, power forward type guy. And so I needed a point guard to give me the ball for me to play well. You know, it wasn't, that, that's just the nature of my role. And I think of him in the same light. So yeah, I, I think, should also mention as well, something about the journey. I, I don't know, there's something about sitting through an 11, 12 goal loss that I fucking love. Like I love sitting there, crossed arms, slumped, like this is a deplorable loss, but I'm not missing a single sec. There's something about it um, I don't know, I might be a little bit sick in the head, but I love it. I love watching us lose, because I love knowing that I was there every second. You know, I, it's just something with me. You've had some iconic moments in losses as well. You've had yeah. the Plowman moment yeah. a it's... few times, and you had the Gibbons moment, yeah. which is probably my favourite, yeah. personal, if we're talking about it. But I agree with you, there's kind of like something in car crash type about it. Yeah, like yeah. You can't help but look. And yeah. I think it's going to be really good when we do start winning to remember we we got battered by GWS with 16 men. Yeah. Like yeah. 100 points. All of those memories. And, and then three men sweet. last year. And like with the Plowman thing, I look back on that and I really I regret it. You know, you never regret anything, but I, I shouldn't have done it um, because, you know, what we're building here and, um, you know, the, the, the fan engagement thing and the players talk about how the comments that the that fans make get to them and, um, as much as it's interesting watching fan reactions and we probably like the real rawness of that, I think across the line. Um, I wish I didn't go so hard at him, but 
yeah, you're right. Like the emotions that come out of this game, like it's it hurts, yeah. you know. And I think because we wanted, we we just want success so bad. And it was that was a moment where it was kind of like, fuck, we're going through it again. When's this shit gonna turn around, you know? Uh, so yeah. Sorry, Lockie, but you pissed me off that day. No, I mean, for me, I find it a good thing. I, I yeah. want to see that because I think it shows we care as fans. Yeah. We, yeah. we care in an extent that we expect better of Plowman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a damnation on him. Yep. I think it's we expect the best from him. Yep. I mean, there's. The Carlton Football Club, mate. Oh, definitely. Let's just remember one thing we are the Carlton Football Club. And. We don't. I know that we're in a rebuild, but we don't just drop our standards. Like we're the we can't football club, you know. We've got to be thinking the best. And I can remember Ricky Gervais in England said that English people are hilarious because when the England football team win on a f- Monday morning, everyone sat at the bus stop talking to each other, asking how the kids are. Yep. But when they lose, they want to stab each other. Yeah. And I think that's a great symbol for what sports about. Yep. It can change. Not just our lives, but our mental state of absolutely, mind as well. Absolutely. And I think for me, the rawness is good. So, I mean, like, your final thought, where do you think 2020 is going to be? So, we do this in a year. Yep. Where are we? Are we in finals? Um, I'm going to say we've won 10 games. I'm going to say we've won 10 games. I think we're going to have, it's going to be an up and down season. We're going to have times where we question what's going on. There are going to be times where people are going to say, and we're going to think, why the fuck do we get rid of Daisy? You know, Simo's hurt, Simo's not playing well. There are going to be times where we question the decisions that we're making this year. But I think ultimately we're going to have something like 10 or 11 wins. Um, I think we'll be in a finals position probably, probably like middle of the year, we'll be looking at it. We might tail off towards the end a bit. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I mean, I feel like it's a 10 or 11 win season. I mean, we didn't get Canelio, so we can't say 13, 14 it's wins. It's my fault, that. That's a dig. Yeah. <laughs> That's the dig. So if I had to hold a gun to your head, what position do we finish? We are going to finish 10th next season. 10th? Yep. You've heard it here first. Yeah. Well, that's Terry. He's my partner in crime. Um, and let us know what you guys think. You answer some of them questions for us. And we hope to see you on Counting People soon. Go the blue boys.